Hi, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sam Osman. I'm a GP in, uh, at Chris Free Health Centre and also the um, IT lead for the CCG. So what I'm going to talk to you first about is the changes that are occurring to ERS, so the old choose and book electronic referral system, um, and that's what I'll do. And then I'll just open it up for a bit of discussion because I know there's uh, questions that come out from this. So where I've presented this before, there's been lots of queries and questions that need clarifying, so I'm happy to take any questions at the end, unless there's anything burning, I'm, I can certainly take it as we go along. So just to put things into a bit of context, really, the aim is for uh, nationally all referrals to be paperless. And when we say paperless, it's all referrals to outpatient clinics. So any outpatient clinic referral uh, must be paperless by October. And that's a national directive. And it's part of the standard contract for the providers and it's part of the GP contract as well from October this year. Um, and there's been an uplift from April, whether or not we've noticed it. Uh, nationally, that's been given from April to try to prepare for this. And Bart's Health have also got a uh, plan in place and they've got um, some capacity and some uh, funding to try to do that as well. So what that means is that all referrals must go through ERS, so we can't send anything by, or we, we can, but there's a likelihood it may well be rejected going forward, um, electronic, uh, other forms that are not ERS. So not via letter, paper, email, it's got to go through this system. Okay, so everyone familiar with this system? All clinicians should be familiar with the ERS system, which is how it exists currently, uh, where you just um, search for a service, you select a service, and then you can just book the patient in or get the patient to book an appointment at a later date. So how it's changing is that, so this is what the screen will soon change uh, to look like. So there'll be a section in green, which will be um, labeling services that have available capacity. We're generally gonna be discouraging people to use this and I'll come on to why and other options that we can use. But these are usually um, private providers or third sector providers that will appear on ERS and so that's what you will see at the top of your screen and also you'll see services that have limited capacity which will be highlighted in red and they're the ones that will be tending to avoid because they'll be the ones that have the longest waits and um, those uh, clinics don't really want any additional referrals made to them. So that's how it's going to change from the way it looks generally. What we're trying to encourage people to do is there's two new methods, there's advice and guidance and there's RAS, which is the Referral Assessment Service. And RAS is what we're preferring people to refer to, but I'll touch upon advice and guidance because this has been in existence for some time. And with advice and guidance, what you do is you have a look um, up here. So where you normally uh, go into ERS normally, there's an option here that says advice. And so you just change that to advice and then everything else is the same in terms of the way that you would choose a service. But then what happens then is that you get an option to just write something um, to the consultant. So say you want to ask the cardiologist a question about a patient, you would do an advice and guidance request and you would just type something um, as you would normally if you were going to email them. So one of the other things that we're trying to use less of is the email um, service that we've got in existence because it's very, uh, very haphazard and doesn't really work very well and there's no targets associated with that in terms of the consultants responding. So with this, there is a, a target that's being audited and it's much easier to audit it through here. So if you want to have a communication via text, advice and guidance is a great way of doing that. And you would just write something to the patient and then they would um, essentially write, uh, they would write back to you. So you'd write a comment, they'd write a comment back and then you can have a conversation as long as you want really until you get an answer to the question you want. You can theoretically add documents to this and attach other things to it, but it's very clunky, doesn't integrate very well with EMIS web, but it's an option there. So it's there. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it there, but it is being promoted across the whole of well, um, and people do use it and do fi find it valuable. So it's still going to be continued to be in existence and Bart's Health are supporting that. RAS, has anybody seen RAS yet? Or anybody referred to RAS? Okay. So RAS uh, is a referral assessment service. So this is a method through which rather than us referring, so normally what we would do, we would select a service here and just uh, tick one of these boxes and then process the referral. 
what we're doing here, we're seeing a blue button here that says send for triage. What that means is that we click that button and um, no uh, letter, nothing gets printed out, nothing really gets generated. All that happens is that a notification goes to secondary care to say that this patient needs to be triaged by you. And then we would attach a referral letter exactly the same way as we do, would do with a normal referral. But the onus is then with secondary care to decide, essentially to triage, to make sure that the patient gets seen in the right place at the right time, potentially with any investigations being done beforehand. Because one of the issues that we're having with secondary care, and one of the reasons that the waiting lists are going up, is that they get seen in the outpatient clinic and they're told, actually, go through some investigations and then come back and see us, or you've been seen in the wrong clinic, I'm going to send you to another clinic. So we want to try and avoid that, and that's one of the strategies that we're using to try to bring the waiting lists down. Sorry, what do you see as, as an advice? Yes. Um, Yeah, so, so, with, uh, so absolutely, so with RAS, you can also ask advice. So one of the options is to actually say, if you don't want the patient to be seen, but you want a detailed letter to be attached, you can do that, and then that will get processed in the same way. So the other option is, and I'll come back how you respond to that, um, is that you can just ask for advice via the RAS method, which is why it encompasses referrals and advice into one. Um, the common uh, skeptic here would say that, uh, the hospital are just going to bounce everything back and just uh, tell GPs to do stuff. And that's something that we are very mindful of. We have told the hospital that is a concern, but they've um, been assured that that's not what they're going to be doing. And what they're keen to do is to get the patient seen in the right place. But we're monitoring the fact that are they just going to bounce people back um, to general practice, which is not the uh, reason that this service has been set up. So, yeah. So it's a good question here about whether a patient's seen in cardiology and when they're seen in cardiology and they feel that they need to be seen in endocrine next and whether that should go through to the GP or not, the answer is no. That should be a direct consultant to consultant referral, which they are aware of. Um, and again, if that's not happening, um, again, that's increasing burden to primary care admin and that's something we should be feeding back because that's not something we should be um, doing. Um, if uh, they've been referred from cardiology to endocrine, you had to, can you see the letter from ca cardiology to endocrine? Um, if it's been done, if the referral letter's been done, then it will be on Cerner, um, and then you should be able to look at it on Cerner. Uh, if they've got an internal process and it's been done off Cerner, then maybe not. But the, the uh, response back to the GP should say, I'm, I'll, I've seen this patient and I refer them on. Yeah, so essentially everything that the hospital do should be electronic and we should be able to view their documents on Cerna. It, and I'm, uh, the, my hesitancy is because I'm not sure if they've got an internal process for them to see that, but the, the process should be that things should come through Cerna so we should be able to <coughs> see um, the, uh, the process. To another um, hospital such as Homerton and, and you do the investigations locally, will the images get transferred? So there's another piece of work that's being developed linking all the uh, systems together. Um, Homerton are coming online, if not already, they are about to come online. So we should be able to see letters that are done at the Homerton on the Cerner portal, as well as investigations, everything else. So, and the hope is that will be across the whole of um, East London, so inner and outer. So theoretically, if our patients go to Queen's, we should be eventually be able to see that as well. So there's a plan to try to get that link, so for us to access any information via one link, potentially. ERA. Yes. So can you attach? So the whole purpose of this is, yes, so you would generate the triage referral and then you would attach a letter and I'll come on to the types of letters that we want attached. Yes, it will be as if you're doing a standard uh, ERS referral. That's the advantage of RAS over advice and guidance. You, you can attach everything within EMIS onto the referral. Okay, so um, these are, this is... Uh, this is an NHS England slide, so um, uh, I've edited the last bit. But what NHS England have said is that um, there's two ways you can refer via ERS. You can make the decision to refer, and then you um, say to the patient where do you want to go, and you book the appointment for them, and the patient walks out with an appointment date and time. Brilliant, but time-consuming. The other option that we often do is we say, yes, you need a referral. You print out the referral, and you say to the patient, yep, you go and book the appointment, um, and they will book their own uh, date and time for that clinic appointment, which is 
find that it works uh, in most situations, which is what most of us tend to do either in the consultation or get the secretaries to do that later on. Uh, NHS England say that that takes a minute of a consultation. Um, I think that's debatable. The option that we're really looking for is you make the decision to refer and you just create the referral via RAS. And I think that's probably doable within a minute and that's what we want to try and work towards. So it's the RAS is what we're really trying to encourage and there's a lot of work going on uh, with BART to try to do that as well. Um, I've got a little uh, video. So there's some videos that have been circulated about this and this is on YouTube with a voiceover of mine uh, if you wish to see. But essentially it just demonstrates how you would do it via uh, RAS and you would do it exactly the same way in terms of choosing a referral as a um, routine um, referral and then you just wait for everything just to churn and then the um, portal will pop up. So this screencast is going to go through referral via RAS so what you would do you'd refer as normal through the e-referral service as you would normally do and when you click here this will open up the e-referral service window and you will then get the list of your services that you will be selecting from. So when this appears, the screen is exactly the same and you would do as you would normally. So within EMIS, it automatically selects it as routine and all you will need to do is click on the speciality, pick the speciality that you would want to refer to and the clinic type. So here I'm gonna choose the anticoagulant hematology clinic and then click on search all. This will then pull up a list of services. So what you can see here is the normal services where you would click to select a service, but also there are these new options below called search for send for triage. And these are the new RAS services, the referral assessment service. When you click here, you'll be able to see the services displayed as they are with a normal referral and then you would just continue and then the patient details you'd confirm and then you would submit. Once this is done the referral will go through and that's it. The triage request has been submitted and all you need to do now is go down to the bottom because this was done within EMIS. What you will find is that you will be able to select the service um, and save it as you would normally and you would do this by just clicking at the bottom where it says please select an action and when you click on this you'll be given two options and you'd click I have selected a service and this will complete the service and you would process it as you would normally. Some questions? Yeah. Are two weeks up and running? So yes so uh, suspected cancer referrals are also going through the RAS route um, and that's live for half of the services. Uh, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about suspected cancer as well. Okay, so what happens to the RAS referral? It goes on to a work list in secondary care. So they see this, which is basically a list of patients that have come through to them, and then they will then just process that uh, referral. What happens uh, from their end is that so we, I've just come from a meeting where we're just trying to iron this out a little bit more because essentially they will then book the patient into a clinic and then inform. Uh, the patient and then we'll be able to um, have a look on Cerna to see if the appointment's been booked. Um, if they, uh, they can theoretically reject the referral as they can a normal referral um, and that comes onto a work list which I'll come onto as well um, or they'll arrange some other, uh, other investigations which again if it's uh, uh, booked electronically should appear on Cerna. There might be some instances where we don't know what's happened to the patient and what we've asked Bart's Health to do is to create a, um, a uh, portal that we can, uh, an email address essentially, that we can email to say what is happening and we've asked them if they can allow patients to do that as well rather than us having that responsibility, the patients can do that. Until that's up and running, uh, if, there's, if you're doing ears referrals and you come into problems, just do it via ears. They've asked us not to do it via ears but I've said ears is the only route for the time being and they, they're happy with that until we get the um, system live uh, to respond otherwise. Okay. So that's what happens at secondary care. And what they've said is that there's a local agreement that uh, there's going to be a response within five working days um, for advice and guidance um, and for RAS, providing that we attach any referral letters within 48 hours or within two working days. So we, we need to ensure that any letters get attached to the referral within two working days. 
which may be uh, requiring some changes within some practices because we want to make sure that if we want the process to res be responsive, we need to be responsive in terms of um, uploading a letter. The uh, response I'm, I'm going to I'm going to come on to that. So yeah, come on to that. And the the uh, response with um, for a suspected cancer referrals is that it's 24 hours. So within 24 hours of a referral being sent, um, the patient uh, is being contacted from uh, Bart's Health. And what what they have said is that whether you do it via RAS or whether you do it uh, via one of the other services, where with one of the other services that aren't on RAS at the moment for the suspected cancers you would be able to book the patient directly into a clinic or um, if you don't book them directly into the clinic and you send the referral in through uh, the system, they will pick it up and they will contact the patient directly. Okay, so uh, the aim for uh, Bart's Health is to respond to suspected cancers within 24 hours or within one working day. In primary care, responses are going to come back onto a work list um, that practices need to be aware of. So it's been in existence for quite some time. So if, um, if we've sent a referral via ERS and it's been rejected or there's been some comment uh, that's been provided back, it's normally ended up on a work list which is in ERS. So one of the things that we encourage practices to do is if they're not doing it already, be aware that there is a work list within ERS that shows you... Um, outcomes of referrals, whether patients have been rejected, whether they've um, been booked elsewhere. So it's, there's a little audit trail within ERS that we can follow through. So uh, this should essentially be cleared regularly by practices. And you can essentially search. If you go into ERS's homepage and put in the patient's NHS number, you'll be able to follow through what's happened to that patient and be able to see what's happened to that referral since you made them. Um, but essentially, if uh, practices aren't doing this, they should be doing this. And there's a uh, communication that we're preparing just to make sure uh, this is being done. And uh, we'll be uh, following up with, um, there'll be some phone calls made to every practice to ensure they're aware of this as well. Within ERS, so within ERS, if you um, go into ERS and you, uh, on the top, there's a button called Worklist, click on Worklist and you get this option. And then you just, there's a big selection here of the type. So it tells you uh, refer action required or um, DNA or patient um, referral rejected. There's a whole list of options that we just need to be working through. So it's worth um, having a look at that. Yes, so for advice and guidance, if you've um, sent an advice and guidance to a uh, secondary care, the response will come on to the work list. So the work list is where uh, you need to be. Uh, every, you've got to go looking for it, yeah. So for right, so the, the agreement is is that so within five so what uh, I've said is that the response should be that um, because we're asking Bart's Health to respond so they've said eighty percent within five days is their target so within after five days if you go on to ERS you should be able to see if they've responded to advice and guidance for a RAS referral. Um, it depends on what, what the outcome is, so whether they've booked the appointment. So the, the whole intention of RAS is to take away the burden from us to try and look at what's going on. So the patient will just be um, dealt with by the hospital. And if there is a response that comes back, then we can look up. Um, and if, we're, if we've got a process by which the work list and primary care are being looked at regularly, and then they can be picked up via that um, process. So it's it, uh, so you can search for all, um, uh, but there are yeah you can if you want to just find out your the referrals that you've done you can filter it so you can filter yep so you'll be able to filter uh, referral action required. See all. Yes. So there are filters. So the question is, are they filters uh, depending on the clinicians? So every clinician that can refer. Uh, will be listed if you pull down this drop down here. So you go into this section to t look at the type of work list, so action required or DNA or whatever, and then you can filter that by clinician or look at all. Okay. Uh, 
Yep. So the question is, what happens to the patient when they've been seen? If, when they've been seen, the process is that the letter comes into the workflow in EMIS. So, like so yeah, like it does now. The whole process here is that initial referral bit. But once they've been seen, it's as is now, where the letter will be um, coming in electronically. And we're getting more and more letters coming in electronically directly into EMIS. And the plan is um, every service uh, will be doing that. And the next step is try and get those letters coded as well. So there's plans um, happening as to how we make that more. In so, yeah, so my, my preference would be RAS rather than advice and guides, mainly because it's, um, it requires a bit more steps to learn. If, you, if you're happy to learn the process for advice and guides, it's fine. It works well, and some people do like it. Waltham Forest love it. Um, and the, a lot of their services, if you have a look, are on advice and guidance. Bart's Health have had mixed uh, messages generally from across the footprint, so they've just put every service on advice and guidance if you want to use it. But RAS is probably the preferred option because then you've got uh, the option of the secondary con consultants actually being um, given the referral and can book them in for things if they feel they want to. So with, so with RAS, so that's what we're just tying up in terms of how they're responding back. Ideally, uh, book the patient in. So what we want to get to a stage where you would just, um, unless you're saying, can you answer this question for me, then they'll respond via the work list. Um, but we want to get beyond that and just say, this is the patient, um, and they will deal with the patient, uh, rather than us then having to start chasing things up. And if things don't happen, there's a process through which either we or the patient can go to Bart's Health and say, what's happening with my referral. And if a patient wants to go to a different trust? So if the patient wants to go to a different trust, then it depends on what services that trust offers. Most other trusts, so um, with RAS, um, because East London have basically designed a lot of it, um, most other trusts wouldn't be on RAS as early as we are. So they will eventually uh, be there. I know UCLH are looking at a few but other trusts are, are developing their own RAS services. But we've got an incentive to bring down um, the waiting list and to get rid of the wastage at the hospital, um, and that's one of the reasons we've gone with it early. Yep. So, yeah, so with advice and guides, is the information going to be invited, embedded into EMIS? No, which is one of the reasons that um, it's not great. So if you want to have an audit trial in EMIS, that needs to be copied and pasted in. Yeah, it's just in the ERS system. So it's just as if you were get, doing an email conversation, um, and if you want that into EMIS, you'd copy and paste it. It's exactly the same. It's basically a, a better auditable email, um, clunky email service. Um, AIRS, Access Issues Resolution Service. Who's not heard of AIRS? Okay, right, so, so if you haven't heard of it, this is an absolute brilliant service. So it's, it's one of the things that, um, if we're going to give awards to Bart's Health, it's probably what we would give them um, awards for. But this is a service where we can direct patients or we could email um, a query about a patient's appointment and they will respond very, very quickly. They're very good. They've got a team of two, two and a half, I think, um, and they've just got a dedicated helpline to resolve any issues with patients who've been referred in. You're not sure what's happening um, to the referral or if they've um, got a letter two days after their appointment was due and they'll be able to sort it all out for you or if you haven't received the letter back so they should be able to sort um, those kind of issues for you so they're very responsive uh, I think the only exclusion criteria is if the patient was seen um, over three months ago or the appointment was three months ago and then you're now chasing it they won't, won't chase that they'll need a new referral but if it's anything within that they're very good at trying to resolve that for you and um, it's probably a service if you're not using it already you should, and there's a telephone number and uh, an email address, and we'll get these slides circulated uh, for you. So, yes, yeah, so if, if your patient comes to you and says, yep, um, or, or that you get a letter, uh, within, if it's within three months of that initial appointment, AIRS can just sort it out. So what I've done, I've just basically opened up the letter that I've done and send via email to AIRS and just said, please, could you rebook this patient in? And they've done that. They, they are very good. Um, other local initiatives um, that we've got, so resource publisher, so um, there's been a lot of work um, and quite a lot of investment in trying to get all referral forms standardised. So sim similar to what we've done with templates, where we've got one template that CG have created and the same template is across every practice. We want to do the same thing with documents and refer referral forms. So we've got the vast majority of referral forms are there. There was quite a lot of teething problems initially, but we're there, I think there's only 
one, maybe two practices that are still having issues. But essentially, um, referral forms should uh, be used only from the resource publisher folder. And uh, we're encouraging practices to start looking at any duplicates that they've got to take off the ones that they have on their local system so that they've, when they search for a document such as the uh, x-ray referral form, um, that will be, you'll only just get the latest form um, that will come up, really. Um, my hesitation about you choosing the x-ray form is that we're also planning to go live with T-Quest radiology very soon. So within the next couple of months, uh, referrals for radiology will be done the same way we do it for pathology, which is all through T-Quest. So we won't have to be printing out forms and things like that. It'll all just be um, done electronically. But all referral forms otherwise, so um, cardiac diagnostics or um, the uh, cardiac investigations or any other referral forms, they're all going to be put onto, or they have already been put onto resource publisher so that we can just access the latest form. Um, and we're getting CG to follow up with the provider to make sure that it is the correct form with the right, pulling in the right information that they require. The other thing that we've asked um, uh, CG to do, which they've done, is to develop template letters. So, for example, if we're referring to cardiology, we've asked the cardiologists, what information do you want from the GP, apart from the usual um, information that they already give you? So whether that's the last three blood pressures, the last three user needs, or whatever. So they've said, we want this, or if they haven't responded, they, they, or we're getting them to respond to say, what is it you want in a referral? And then that referral template letter is what we want practices to use when they're referring to outpatient clinics. So um, the way you would do that is if you're referring to cardiac outpatients, if you just been in cardiac, you will get um, cardiac outpatient uh, referral letter um, and you would just choose that particular template letter uh, to use. And it will pull in the demographic of the patient, of the practice, um, and also uh, the last consultation and any other information that the hospital require. And that's something which is already live now and we're encouraging practices to use that. There is a YouTube video describing that in a bit more detail, um, which uh, if you haven't seen, uh, we can certainly get the link circulated for. So thanks, Kenny. So that was basically explaining the fact that on the referral forms, there's um, links to other parts of the internet um, and other resources that you can look at to get a bit more information rather than putting everything onto one long referral form. Yeah, so any other services, so any services for investigations or for community services, um, they're the forms that will be on Resource Publisher and they are emailed to those specific um, services. Yes. So the clinic ones, so, so they're the outpatient referral letters. So they're the letters um, under uh, Resource Publisher. Uh, so under Resource Publisher, there's a outpatient referral letters. Okay, so... I'll, I'll just, uh, under there, so there, there is, just to have a look at the, we'll have a look at the terminology uh, because um, it should be labelled, so we've got cardiology, outpatient letter, uh, breast outpatient letter, surgical outpatient letter. They are the f letters that you use to generate the letter that you attach to ERS. Does that make sense? So when you're, if I do a cardiology outpatient referral, the process should be, I, I do the referral via RAS, and then I um, generate the letter which pulls in the details. So we use a standard letter and you can uh, add in whatever information you want in addition and that gets attached to um, the ERS referral rather than currently what normally happens is that most practices generate their own letter and then that gets attached to ERS um, by their own practice. Okay. So, so the question is about finding the forms, how can you know? It, it is a very difficult thing because um, if you ask 10 different people how to label a form, we'll get different responses and the hospital have got a different response. And we have got a guide, so CG have got a guide as to what they want as a standard. And what we've done is that, or what we can do is add keywords. So for example, if it's um, uh, a single point of access, but you've put in physio, the keyword physio should bring up that particular form. Um, and it's, it is, it's, it's a difficult one, I know, but the, it's mainly these services that are um, designing the forms and we're just trying to liaise with them to try to get the writing right. But what we're trying to do is add in as many keywords as we can. If there are keywords missing, um, I'm, I'm happy to pick up on them and, uh, and edit the form. Uh, but but I, you get that adjusted. But it, it's, it's a difficult one because um, what you don't want is have too many keywords and then you get 
too many forms that come up and then people say which one's the right one because it's putting so it's it is a little bit complex um, to try to sort things out but yeah happy to look at individual forms if they are causing problems so yes you can so uh, once you've generated the ERS referral you get a box that, that you then confirm you can code and then you can either get somebody else to do the letter or you can do the letter then and there you can do it then and there by you get several options. I think defer, defer to someone else, or do now. If you um, do now, you can create, or there's an option that says create letter. So you click on the create letter, yeah. and then you just bring up that particular. So you can use options, yeah, so when you create letter, it will bring up the documents option, and then you just type in cardiology, and then one of the options will be cardiology outpatient letter. So certainly um, have a look, and I'll circulate the, the YouTube link that demonstrates it uh, as well. But um, it, yeah, I'd, I'd have a look because it, it, uh, it's easier to demonstrate than it is um, to actually talk about. So, yeah, one more and then I'll come there. One other very good question. Why does radiology ask for Why does radiology... Okay, so radi this, is, this is something we've battled for a long time. It's essentially it's because we, uh, they are insistent on a signature and we are insistent that we're not going to get practices to print something out, sign it, scan it back in to send to you. So the agreement is the qualifier that it is you, the verification is a GMC number. So that's a verification. That will go when we get TQuest because that will pull it in automatically through 3 miss. But it's, it's basically replacing the signature, uh, which is the agreement we've got with the trust because they still want something um, to justify it's you. So uh, the question is, uh, it's very annoying pulling in the last consultation. If it was me, I'd say uh, uh, leave it out, and then if people want to put it in, put it in. But this is, again, variation. We want to have something that works for everyone. So what we've done, when you launch the letter, the option you get, the only option you get is which um, problems do you want to pull in? Because one of the issues is that um, people get referral letters in secondary care with like a two-page problem list to start with. And, and one of the things that um, we've uh, had fed back is that that's, probably not always appropriate. And so what we've done is that um, when, you gen when you pull up the letter, when you say, oh, I want to generate a letter, it will just pop up a problem list and it will have the active and I think the significant past highlighted and uh, you've got the option to remove them or add others if you want to. And then click OK and it's generated. It pulls in the last consultation, but you just delete it if you don't want it. Um, and, but it, it's there. We've had people say we want the last three consultations. Some people say we don't want any consultations. So we've just said the last consultation and we'll uh, hold it there. I'm just going to, uh, and I'm um, coming uh, to the end of my time, so I'll just rattle through the other things. I'm going to talk about Skype in the next uh, bit, um, but also just uh, oops, bear in mind that um, EMIS Anywhere, every practice has uh, been offered EMIS Anywhere laptops, um, and if you haven't put your name forward, um, there's a wave two, maybe a wave three that you can apply to. Uh, it's been piloted in one network already, but the whole purpose of this is for EMIS Anywhere laptops to be provided with a full EMIS on a laptop, mainly for, the funding is mainly for, for business continuity, so if systems go down, if you get another cyber attack, you can function as a practice using your EMIS Anywhere laptops, um, and together with Wi-Fi, that's also coming into every practice, uh, that's going to be a way of continuing work if a, a major incident occurs. Um, and just be aware of uh, if you get the laptops, please use them because we want to get feedback on how we can utilize them more. Um, they can be used for hot desking, remote working, so just use them for how you feel would benefit, but always have one as a backup um, that the practice can have as an emergency if you have system down for whatever reason. Um, EMIS Mobile uh, is also available. The, uh, it's on iPads and Android tablets. If you haven't looked at it, download it, have a look at it. It's free for another month, I think. Um, and then um, the EMIS are going to start charging for it. It's a brand new way of um, consulting slightly differently. It's a cut down version of EMIS, but it works very well if you're doing uh, quick home visits or quick reviews. Uh, we haven't developed any templates for it because uh, we're not quite sure about the uptake. But if people are liking the way EMIS mobile works, we can think about how that can be worked into um, providing via CG as well. Yeah. So license, yeah, so the it's free at the moment for EMIS Mobile. You need to be attached to a practice uh, and uh, you need to sync the iPad to the practice. Uh, so there's a bit of technical, so, which is very easy before. If you've tried it before, it, uh, you just give up because it was too clunky. Now it's a lot easier to sync. And once it's synced, it's very easy to use. Um, but 
So no, you, can, you don't need an N3 connection to use it. You can use it. Uh, you can use it at home. I've used it at home to, uh, to test, and uh, not to, to too much else. It's good. Uh, um, we've done quite a lot of questions as along the way. Is anything burning? Otherwise, I'll move on to Skype. Okay, I'm, I'm happy for you to contact me uh, if uh, you want to ask anything else than that. So Skype. So NHS Mail has been around, and we're really fortunate in Tamlets. We've got virtually universal coverage of everybody using. NHS Mail locally um, and one of the additional options with the new uh, NHS Mail service is that we can get a bolt-on uh, for Skype for business. This would allow us to do audio and video consultations and we've got some funding uh, through Health Education England to get a license for every practice. So we've got at least one license for every practice and also giving licenses to um, community colleagues such as Taz Chowdhury and uh, we'll get some licenses out to uh, social care and, and uh, palliative care as well. But the whole point of using this is to really try to emphasise how can we do meetings better. So whether that be practice meetings or MDT meetings. And we really want to try and enable this and then get practice to start using it and then to feedback how they are using it. And then we can think about how we can um, get some more funding to develop more licences for this. So essentially the way we want it to work. So if you've got a member of your practice team who uh, isn't able to come into your clinical meeting, um, then they could potentially just Skype in and they could just uh, communicate and be part of the meeting that way and um, just, just share information, um, but remotely. We also want to develop MDT meetings to work in the same way. So we've had conversations with Taz Chowdhury about doing the uh, diabetes um, meetings remotely. So he's spending quite a lot of time traveling between practices and we could do double the amount of practice visits uh, if we enable him to just uh, attend virtually. But we want the tech to work uh, before, uh, before he does that. So he's quite keen to pilot this um, if anybody wants to specifically lead, lead on this. But we're developing a way of doing it with him. So we've got licenses for each practice. And um, the way that we've worked it is that the licensed account will create the meeting and then everybody else logs in as a guest. You don't log in with your own... NHS net login because you'll need a license if you do that but everyone else connects as a guest and um, the one account in the practice is the one that creates the meeting so that's technically how it works there's a guide that's been circulated um, uh, to help you work through that and uh, if you feel you need a bit more information we can develop some other resources we, we've talked about getting a screencast developed to help as well but essentially the licensed account um, creates the, the meeting, there is, a, uh, e, there is a, um, a link that you can click on to. I've just created a short link that you can uh, just use instead. And essentially, you just log in to that scheduler, set up your meeting with the date and time that you want, add in any other users that you want to uh, invite, and then you send that uh, out. So what happens is that you get a link that's generated that you can then further email on to other people that you want to invite to that meeting. Um, and then on the day of the meeting, all you do is that the people will link in uh, using that link as a guest. Then maybe if you're doing it for the first time on a PC, you have to download a, a web app, which doesn't need an admin account. You can just download it on your usual login and then just join, click join the meeting. And when you do that, it will just bring up um, a, uh, another box. So you just type in your name and then you're connected to the meeting. So it's relatively straightforward to use. Uh, a few practices have used it for their own practice meetings. We haven't got MDT meetings off the ground using this as yet. But certainly, if you haven't um, got your license details or you haven't got your free webcam, contact Equimal, who will gratefully help. We're also developing um, a process. So the other bit on NHS Mail, which is free, actually, is instant messaging. So this is where we can communicate within Teams. It requires um, instant message for NHS Mail to be loaded onto every desktop. So we're talking to IT to get instant message on every desktop in, uh, in Tower Hamlets. And what that will mean is that uh, we're going to start off with practice nurses because they've asked for this uh, to communicate with each other. But theoretically, all you would do is that if you've got a query within your consultation, you can send a message to your group and it will pop up on their desktop and then they can answer it or they can choose to ignore it. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of instant messaging securely uh, within um, a group 
and uh, potentially you can use it, you can download Skype for Business on your phone and set up groups uh, if you wanted to within your own practice teams. You can do it now, it's free as long as you've got an NHS mail account and it is uh, on Skype or they've got to have the link. So with the link, so when you create the meeting, uh, you can be the controller, so if, um, you can only access the meeting through the link, and then if people join, you're not sure, you just um, just reject them. So if you're not sure who it is, so if people are joining remote, so to start with, it will probably just be one or two people that you know are joining, um, and you know that that's how it's going to start. But you know when it starts becoming a lot bigger, I think we need to have a bit more governance that you know who's joining. Um, but it's it's certainly something to think about. You don't want people that you don't want to join the meeting, join the meeting.